from the southern tip of Africa comes a voice of revival. A voice revealing God's truths and desires for our lives. A voice equipping saints with the practical application of God's Word. We've got to have a firm foundation and that's the Word of God. So have your Bibles, notepads and pens ready as we get into more practical application from God's Word. Now all that's required is for us to have an absolute trust in this Word. Let's join Alan Bagg for more wisdom for life. Good morning again, dear friend. Welcome back. This is Wisdom for Life. My name is Alan Bagg. And once again, we are getting together to study God's rich, powerful, <laughs> unchanging, incorruptible Word. It is seed that produces life in our lives. And we're talking about this week, possession by confession. The power of a positive confession. It is so important to know that the words we speak produce life. Or they can produce death. It is important for every Christian to know that the only way we take possession of any promise is through what we say. Remember the last couple of days we've had a look at the children of Israel who were delivered out of Egypt, out of bondage, and were headed for the promised land. And God had said to them that He is giving them a land, a land that is rich, a land that is prosperous, and that every need will be met in that land. And so when they got there, they sent the 12 spies in. The 12 spies came back and 10 of them said, we can't do it. This land is, is horrendous. It's full of giants. Uh, the cities are fortified. We don't know. We, we're probably going to all get killed in there. And of course, the rest of Israel believed those 10. Joshua and Caleb, on the other hand, said, no, we are well able. We're going to take the land because it's a good land. God has promised it and it's ours. But the children of Israel didn't listen to those two. They went with the other ten. And the problem is the result of them saying that, they landed up in the wilderness for 40 years. The children of Israel all passed away and the new generation grew up. And Joshua and Caleb were the only two that were alive when they got back to the river Jordan. And God spoke to Joshua and said, Now you go in. Keep the word on your lips. Don't let it depart from your mouth. You do everything I commanded you to do and you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. And as a result, they went in and they took possession of their land. Now I want us to see this truth from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Now you may have a hope. God has spoken to you a promise. Maybe it's a specific promise or a promise from the word that you have a hope for. Now hope, when we talk about hope in terms of the world, the world kind of uses the word hope kind of like an empty wish. Uh, you know, God's healed you. Yeah, I sure hope so. You can hear it's a very empty form of hope. But hope, when God gives a hope, there's an assurance. There's an expectation. There's a knowledge that if God spoke, it's going to be done. Now, faith is what gives that hope substance. It's what brings that hope into reality. Now, with that word hope in mind, come and have a look across the page at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. The writer says here, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Now, it's interesting that he should say, The way you hang on to hope is by speaking it. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope. And the only way that we possess anything in the body of Christ is through confession. Let's go back to Mark chapter 11. We had a look at this earlier on, but now I want you to see how this fits into with what we're saying right now. Mark chapter 11, verse 23. Now, often I've heard uh, people talk about faith and they say things like, Oh, I, I don't agree with that faith movement. I don't agree with faith and, uh, or, or that faith movement. Faith is not a movement. Remember Hebrews 11 verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God. So when it comes to faith, it's not whether I believe in the movement or not, whether I think it's a, a form of religion. No, I want to go with what Jesus said. And what Jesus said is in verse 22, Jesus said to them, have faith. In God. So he's about to demonstrate faith. It says in verse 23, For assuredly I say to you. Now, I'd like you, your, your Bible, if you have a Bible that has red and black, can you see this is red? 
This is what Jesus said. I want you to, in verse 22, underline, Jesus answered. So this is Jesus' opinion. He's about to speak here. This is what Jesus says. Verse 23. For assuredly I say to you, whoever says to the mountain, underline the word says, be removed and be cast see, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things he says, underline the word says again, and he will be done. He will have whatever he says, underline the word says. Now take the word believe and put a little circle around it. Now, let me ask you, how many circles do you see? There's one. How many underlines do you see? There's three there. Jesus said that if you say with your mouth and you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe, whatever you believe, you say. Look again. He who says to the mountain, be removed, be cast and does not doubt in his heart, but believes. Believes what? The things that he says will come to pass. So we have to believe that what we say comes to pass. If you can believe that what you say comes to pass, you will have whatever you say. Hallelujah. So, first thing that I have to do is renew my mind to believe that when I speak, those things I say happen. And when I do that, then I fill my heart with the Word of God and start declaring with my mouth those things. And those are the things that are going to come to pass. See, if someone says, oh, I don't really believe in that. Well, someone can say, I don't believe in gravity. And if they jump off a 30-story building, hanging <laughs> on all the way down, say, I don't believe in gravity. Gravity is there. Gravity is going to come to pass. And gravity is going to produce what gravity is designed to do. And that is bring everything back down to the earth, including the person that's falling. So, one has to recognize that by... The fact that this life has been designed to operate in a certain way, God designed gravity, denying it's there, it's always there. In the same way, your life is a product of what you've been saying. And so it's a fact that God cannot do anything more for me than what I release through my words. And that is an outstanding statement. God cannot do anything more for you than what you release through words. Look what it says in Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18, you have a look over here at verse 21. He says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Now, you know, for a long time I thought death and life were in the power of God. Because that's what traditional religion will tell us. But yeah, the Bible's clear, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Someone says, yeah, but... I don't really agree with that. Well, keep reading. And those who love it will eat the fruit of it. So in other words, if I can come to a place where I believe and I love the fact that when I speak, it produces life or death, if I can understand that, then I'll begin to eat the fruit of it. In other words, when I determine that I'm no longer going to speak death over my life, if death is in the power of my tongue, then I'm not going to speak death over it. And if life is in the power of my tongue, then I'm going to speak life. You remember at the end of the program, I always say, life is a choice. Choose life. Now, the reason I say choose life is because a lot of people think life just happens. It's not. It's a choice. In fact, God said to the children of Israel, I lay before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. The blessing has to be chosen. How do I choose it? Through my speech. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. So, if I want to see life, I choose life by speaking life. Now, that word that I speak is, of course, the word of God. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to Mark chapter 4. We are talking about the power of confession. Now, Jesus said, remember he said in verse 14, the sower sows the word. In other words, the word of God is seed. 1 Peter 1.23 tells us that the word of God is incorruptible seed. Incorruptible seed. Now, what's incorruptible seed? Well, in my hand here, I have a, an avocado seed. Now, we can see that this avocado seed is already 
experienced corruption. The, 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 the outside has peeled off and it's begun to shrivel up. But you know what? When this seed was in its prime, when you plant a seed, that seed will always produce a harvest. Now, a seed produces a tree after its own kind. This is an avocado seed. So if I plant this avocado seed, it will produce an avocado tree. Now, I can count the seeds here. I can see there's one seed. But you realize that through this seed, I can produce an avocado tree that will produce a whole bunch of other avocados. Then if you take each of those avocados and you plant those again, though all the seeds that are inside those avocados, they in turn produce more trees. And then all of those trees will produce even more avocados. Now let's say for a moment that all the avocados in the world disappeared. And I have the last seed in my hand. Well, I have enough in my hand here to produce enough avocado pears to feed the entire world. That's how powerful a seed is. I hold in my hand the future of the avocado population. Amen. Can you see that? So that's how powerful a seed is. Now, this is an avocado seed, as I said. Uh, of course, it's subject to corruption. If it gets wet before it's planted, it can rot. It can disappear. It can, it, you know, well, it can fade away. It can become destroyed into a place where it can no longer produce. But God's Word is incorruptible seed. That means it is seed that will always produce after its own kind and it will always continue to produce. It's a living seed that never dies. Now, let's go and have a look at Mark chapter 4 verse 26. The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. So this is how the whole kingdom operates. Scattering seed. And he sleeps by night, he rises by day, and the seed itself sprouts and grows. He himself does not know how. See, even with this avocado seed, I don't know how it works. Now, I know the basics. I, you know, I did biology at school. I know you've got to put this thing in the ground, and then the water comes on it, and I know inside there's a little goody that begins to germinate, and that thing grows up. I don't even remember all the terminology, but... I know the seed will split open and a little green shoot will come out. I know the basics. But the internal workings of it, I don't know how everything works. When Jesus said a seed is planted, it dies and then it produces growth. See, we don't know the workings of it. But here's the thing. I don't have to know. I don't have to know how the seed works. All I know is that if I plant it, it will produce. So when I dig a hole put this thing in the ground and begin to water it. It has been designed to grow. Now the seed itself does not have enough in it. All it has is the life. But it produces from the soil, it starts to change that soil and it begins to produce a plant that grows out of the ground and that plant eventually grows up to be a massive tree. Now the earth itself brings that forth. That's what the word is saying here. The man does not know how, but the earth heals the crops. Verse 28. By itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that, the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So, I don't have to stress about how the seed it produces. I don't have to stress about whether it's going to grow or not. All I have to know is the whole kingdom of God has been designed. That if I would plant the seed of God's Word, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Luke chapter 8, Mark chapter 4, the Word of God is seed. When that seed is sown, it always produces. Now, you'll recall I spoke early on and, and over the last two days about the children of Israel. I kept saying that Joshua and Caleb spoke and said, that I am going, that we can are well able to produce, we are well able to possess. And because they said they are well able to possess, they took that land and they possessed it. The ten spies that said they're not able to possess, they landed up not possessing and dying in the wilderness. In other words, they got what they said. Now this is confirmed in the word in Numbers chapter 14, 
Verse 28. God speaking, yea, says, As I live, says the Lord, just as you spoke in my hearing, so I will do to you. That's interesting. God is saying what they said is what they got. God said so. Now, there's a number of scriptures that confirm that. Job chapter 22, verse 28 he says, you will also declare a thing, and it will be established for you. In other words, when you say something, you produce that thing. I like the way the Amplified puts it. Listen to this. You shall also decide and decree a thing. You know, so often Christians will go through life and, and just kind of exist. Wake up in the morning and whatever happens that day happens. Whatever comes to pass, comes to pass, whatever goes wrong, goes wrong, or what comes right, well, praise God, it came right. But notice he says yeah, we need to decide. In other words, begin your day in deciding, saying, right, now, what are we going to produce out of this day? What am I believing God for? What are the various things that I'm trusting God for? Have a prayer journal, write down when you believe in God for certain things. And then, when you make a decision, you say, you know what, I'm deciding that this is what's going to happen. This is what's coming to pass. He says, when you decide and then decree a thing, it shall be established for you, and the light of God's favor shall shine upon your ways. Hallelujah. Notice he says here, when you decree it, God's favor shows up. I tell you, it's something that I use regularly in my walk with God. It's a decision that each and one of us need to make and say, Lord, I believe your word. I'm making a decision on it. I'm going to believe this word. And as I decree it, it is established. I believe I'm debt free. It is established. I believe my home is paid for completely. I own it debt free. It is established. My God supplies every need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. What are you doing? You're confessing the word, and as a result of it, it is established, and God's favor shines on it. Praise God. Now, go back to Mark chapter 4, and we're going to have a look at just how important that seed is. Verse 13, Jesus said, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. So we've already established that the Word of God is seed. As you keep reading down, you see He says, These are the ones sown by the wayside where the Word is sown. Satan comes immediately and takes away the Word that was sown. Verse 16, Second soil. These are ones sown on stony ground. Who, When they hear it, the Word immediately receive it with gladness, and they have no root in themselves, and endure only for a time. And afterwards... When tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, they stumble. Then verse 18, these are ones sown among thorns, the third type of soil. These are the ones that hear the word, and when they hear it, the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and the word becomes unfruitful. Verse 20, these are ones sown on good ground. Now one would almost say that that's a fourth ground which is true because if you keep reading these are the ones that hear the word they accept it and bear fruit some 30 fold some 60 and some 100 in other words 30 times over what was sown so if you plant one seed you get 30 harvests out of that 30 fruits or you get a 60 fold return or a 100 fold return so we see that in the fourth type of soil, the good soil, there's actually three categories. 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. Now, to me, that is a growth that takes place. Not every, Well, there's two reasons. First of all, not every seed produces exactly 100 times. So some seeds produce, for example, uh, if a farmer is farming cows and sows seed into one cow, that cow is going to produce one calf. You're not going to get 100 calves come out of that cow. So we understand that certain seeds will produce after their kind. But the method, the amount of production depends on that soil. As one grows and one develops in the Word of God, you become more skilled in the Word. You become more focused in what you believe. You become more direct with what you're saying. 
And as you do that, you upgrade the soil. So you go from 30-fold production to 60-fold production to eventually to 100-fold production. And my desire for you is that you become a 100-fold production type of soil. So here we see that there are actually six types of soil. Three didn't produce and three did produce. So the question really is, which one am I? Which one are you? The only way to do that is to go through it step by step and have a look at each particular soil and how they all work. And when we discover how they work, then we can decide which one we are and then make the adjustments because even if you find that you have wayside soil, when you first plow that wayside soil, it becomes hard soil, uh, becomes rocky soil. When those rocks are all taken out, then the first thing you may land up with is thorns and, and weeds. But get rid of the weeds and the thorns. As you do that, the soil becomes more productive. You begin to produce 30-fold and in time 60. And then when that soil has really been well worked and well fertilized and, 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 and well prepared, it then is able to produce a 100-fold harvest as a result of that. So that's what we're going to do over time. We're going to have a look and, and, and see how it produces. But just before we close, come with me to Luke chapter 8. I want to show you a cross-reference here in verse 11. Jesus said, now the parable is this. The seed is the Word of God. The seed is the Word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the Word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. So the heart is the soil, and Satan is trying to take the seed out of the heart, lest you believe and be saved. Now I know as you've given your life to Jesus, you're already born again, you are already saved. I'm not talking about salvation for eternal life. I'm talking about salvation from debt, salvation from sickness, salvation from destruction, salvation from anything that the curse has tried to throw against you. The production of God's seed in your heart is what rescues you from those situations. I'm fed up with the way the enemies try to steal from you. And so tomorrow what we're going to do is have a look at how this word is sown. How the word of God as a seed will produce in your life healing, protection, deliverance, and provision. And everything you need. And until then we're going to have a look at this. I'll see you right on. People that understand the kingdom of God, understand the purposes of God, understand the kingdom of God, God has prepared this year. You've been listening. God has positioned you. He's equipped you. He's prepared you. He's enabled you. He's empowered you. And it's for a purpose. That purpose is about to manifest. This conference is probably the, the highlight of the year. It's just, it's just exciting to be here. It's awesome to be here. Oh, it's been awesome. I've been having a good time. The Word. The Word works for me. You can feel the Holy Spirit from the moment you come in. Very, very excited, very blessed, very anointed. The possibilities are going to show up. The opportunities are going to show up. But only those that are equipped and positioned will be able to access them will be able to penetrate them, will be able to tap into them. What the Lord is saying is prepare. prepare. When I go out here, I will, I will be able to share some of this what I've experienced here, take it back to my home. Camp. It's a whole life change. The anointing and the grace is opening up for you unlimited possibilities. possibilities. God exalts His very own Word higher than His name. God's Word, a creative force that God Himself exalts above His own name. So God understands the value of His Word. There is so much power available in His Word. In my hand, I hold everything I have ever needed in life and godliness. It's that power that God has made available to you. If I have the seed, I have the harvest. It's just a matter of time. This series will help you receive the healing you need. It will help you bring financial freedom into your life and will help you produce everything that God said you could have. God is only prepared to move based on what you say. By your words, you can increase or destroy your life. So if you never speak, God is not able to do. Contact us at these details. 
get this series and live life the way God has it. God has placed within us the right, the ability and the command to speak what we believe. The confession brings possession. Make sure you get your set today. Get a hold of these CDs, plug them in, listen to them over and over and over and allow the word of God to renew your mind so you get to a place where you are so confident and comfortable with speaking only the word and you will watch the whole everything that God has promised you begin to come to pass in a very accelerated and quick way so make sure you get your set today now friend I also want you to know that God loves you he has paid the price for you he has given his son Jesus to die for you all you have to do is believe that today as you believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth you will be saved. Now, that's a prayer of confession again. You see, you possess even eternal life through confession. So I'm going to lead you in that prayer right now. Pray this with me out loud. Say, Dear Jesus, thank you for dying for me. You paid the ultimate price. I believe with all my heart that you rose from the dead, that today you are alive. And I call you my Lord, you are my Savior, and I know as I do this, I am now born again, a child of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God, my friend. If that's the first time you ever prayed that prayer, I've got a gift for you. This is a Bible study that will take you through your Bible in a year. Also, this little card explains to you what just happened in your life and what's going to happen now that you are a Christian. And then this wonderful CD or tape, you can request whichever one you want. And I'd like to sow that into your life free of charge. And if you just call us on that phone number, write to me at that address. As soon as we get it, I'll send it to you. I'll even pay the postage. But uh, I just want to encourage you and let you know you've begun a great walk with Jesus. To all our partners out there, I want to say thank you so much for the way you continue to support us and see that this work can continue. And thank you for writing. I really appreciate the letters that we receive. I enjoy reading about what God has done in your life and also let you know that any prayer requests we have, we're praying over every day. Well, tomorrow we're going to carry on with this wonderful study. Until then, this is Pastor Alan Bagram reminding you Jesus is Lord. And remember, life is a choice. Choose life. God bless you. Alan Bag Ministries has made this week's Wisdom for Life programs available on CD and DVD. To order this week's programs, contact us at this number or these addresses.